Welcome back. Jackie, can I ask you, I accept, you know, your point made earlier that women have also got to do this, shouldn't rely on the state entirely. But one of the questions that has been raised consistently is the way in which we seem to be giving more power to traditional chiefs, which hardly seems to me to be congruent uh, with a broader spread of gender equality. In fact, it seems to reproduce forms of patriarchy in the rural areas, which is deeply disturbing. You know, I'm not a person that can speak about the rural people, and I think it's always very important that when we talk about rural people, they must speak for themselves. Yeah. I'm a township girl, and I would hate to be speaking for them, but uh, as we know and we have been studying and we've, the research has shown that uh, we are seeing that Patrick is in the township, it's actually in the rural areas. You'll be surprised that women in the rural areas can sit together, they can talk about things that they prefer, that they want, that they want change. They can discuss about issues about education because what is the most important thing that is happening in our government is education. I we have to it. continue educating people in the rural areas everywhere about, we cannot have policies. But and if, then you give more power, have if you give people. more power to traditional chiefs, they essentially reproduce a particular form of hierarchy. I don't think one has to be in the rural areas to know that. There's enough research on the ground. I'm curious as to what the Women's League is saying about these things. But how can we say that we are giving powers to the chief? The women themselves that are actually uh, uh, partners or wives to the chiefs, they must be empowered to be able to speak for themselves. Well, aren't and you disturbed by some of the legislation? There's been serious criticism lately of recent drafts of legislation which seem to give more power to the traditional chiefs. I'm curious as to the Women's League saying, hang on a moment, is this correct given our great enterprise to spread gender equality? I'm sure you're aware that the Women's League is now from the policy conference. And in that po uh, document that you are having, that we are having as a Women's League, you realize that uh, there are discussions that have been going on and noting that the former minister uh, Lulu Kwingwani in the women's ministry spoke about things that we should learn not to speak for the rural people. They must speak for themselves. And I'm sure if we can uh, go back and look at what they are saying, we'll be able to appreciate. But I don't think women in the rural areas, they'll allow anybody to be controlling them as it happened Well, before. I'm not sure about because that. Because I know for yeah. a fact yeah. that the women's league is doing their utmost best we go down there to make sure that we start by educating because it doesn't help that we have documents, we have big books, but we don't go down and be able to explain to people in their own languages. All right. I mean, there's serious legislation which is empowering chiefs. Mm -hmm. That reproduces patriarchy. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's a no-brainer. That's what's happening. I think that w w what is also interesting is if we look at, um, for example, the time of the, when the traditional courts bill mm -hmm. um, was... Well, there was a huge parliament. fight about that. But what, what stood out for me is the very, um, I, you know, what I took from that is the very vociferous civil society mobilization around that. And I think that, you know, what is enheartening is that there's a very strong for lack of a better word, women's movement, if you like, who um, had raised serious contestation around that piece of legislation and, and to the point where I think that, you know, in, in some ways it had some impact. So you saying that as we tracked along, there was a sufficient mobilization to restrain uh, an extension of powers to traditional leaders which would essentially extend patriarchy? No, so what I'm saying is that um, we had... Uh, civil mobilization in the form of women's groups um, making oral submissions and written submissions to contest the traditional courts bill. And I think, you know, it was with some success. And it spoke to, because I mean, one looks at, at the trajectory of that period, there was very ardent mo social mobilization. And um, organizations in civil society were very active and very vociferous. And can I just say that thank goodness for that, since it's increasingly well, that's what clear yeah. that the ANC Women's League is either just lacks the will or, or the capacity to mobilize on these issues. And this is why, thank goodness, we have this 
the civil society that can pick up that slack, frankly. Because on the occasions when the ANC Women's League announces that they do want to intervene on an issue, it seems that they are just not taken seriously. They went to Mangaung, for instance, announcing that they hope to get a resolution on the decriminalization of sex work. I mean, that didn't happen. Their interventions are so selective that it's hard to, to, see, to see the coherent plan in them. You know, they'll launch an extensive campaign on Boko Haram, for instance, and the campaign to bring back the missing schoolgirls, but will say nothing on the most, you know, egregious gender problems within our own country, often. How do you respond to that, Jackie? You'll, you'll be surprised that uh, people who want to speak for the Women's League. I, one of the ladies spoke about the Women's Coalition, and I could guess that he, she was part of it. Where's the Women's Coalition today? Today, the Women's League managed to can come up with the progressive women's movement of South Africa because they were failed by organizations. But who was the, the one, I said, let me ask you something, who were the people who resisted the traditional court bill? They were a coalition of, of civil society, if I recall correctly. You are correct, even the Women's League was part of it. But what did the Women's League do in regard to that? That's what, that's what people want to know. You know, I don't remember the last part of it, but I remember there was a conference in Cape Town where the rural people were speaking with the minister and they made a submission. And I know for a fact that we supported them because we're pushing to say that they, they know their situations better. And I'll be surprised that we want to talk about women, women, and the chiefs. Why don't we talk, when we talk about gender issues, it's about men and women equally. Why because don't we educate men to understand what their women are looking I'm for? I'm getting there, because but I, I'm, 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 I'm going to get there. But the point I'm putting to you is that when you give greater powers to traditional leaders, you are reinforcing forms of patriarchy. And, that, and, that's, uh, and this, uh, this therefore applies to millions of South Africans. It's an important question. Not the only one, but it's an important one. That's why I'm putting it to you. All right, let me, let me move on then, if I may. One of the issues I mentioned in the introduction was the unspeakable levels of gender violence. We are off the charts. So let me just, just start before we get there. You reported in the Oscar Pistorius case. Yes. It seemed to be a monument to just how unreconstructed we are. I mean, this was a case about what had happened about a woman who was murdered. Now, these things are replicating themselves right through, and yet when you read the discourse, there seemed to be such gross insensitivity to the broader problems in which this case was located. And I'm curious as to why that was. Is it because he was just a celebrity, and somehow they get a free pass? Are you saying that the, the problem with the social discussion around the, yes. the trial? How much was it concentrated on the fact that this was, that this was just a, another major manifestation mm -hmm of what is happening day in and day out in our country where women are getting brutally assaulted. Look, I think the problem with the Pistorius case, as you'll appreciate yourself as a man of the law, is that um, it was very hard to use it, as I'm sure gender organizations would have wished to, as a springboard for discussions about, for instance, domestic violence, without a verdict confirming that it was an intentional killing. I mean, Even if it wasn't an intentional killing? No. I, I, I agree with you, Judge. I mean, I think that the, the Pistorius case was emblematic of this machismo culture gone mad, of this, you know, violent um, need for, for guns, of the, the, the treatment of women as disposable. I mean, I think all that, those things are right. But I also understand that it was difficult, perhaps in, at least an issue for the media, to, to turn that into a discussion about violence against women when you have a person on trial who is who has a version of events which are quite different. Amazing, Legally, how, that's amazing how the press don't do that when it's some poor, uh, uneducated person from the township. So then they've got plenty to say. That's, and here was a high-profile case where they could have said things. I mean, some of us tried, Judge. Some of us I'm tried. I'm not suggesting they didn't. Take a break and I want to come back. 